Last, uh, last talk um, at this uh, puppet, puppet camp, puppet day at the uh, Armel conference. So um, we are welcoming uh, Steve Traylon from, from CERN, which is going to talk to, to us about uh, how they are using and how they are going to use puppets at uh, CERN here in Geneva. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so as a, I'm from a CERN IT department, uh, just here in Geneva, just up the road. So what I wanted to um, talk about, so I'll, I'll do, I will introduce CERN a little bit, just talk about uh, why CERN's there and uh, some of the sort of physics and what's purpose in life, and then particularly then how we currently deploy um, our machine room at CERN, and in particular why we want to potentially change this, why we plan to change this and then move to Puppet. And then having done that, what are the uh, sort of interesting things along the way we've done in the first six months of doing this migration? So CERN uh, is known as the, uh, the European Laboratory for Particle Physics. It is always targeted at uh, fundamental research uh, and uh, between Geneva and Duramount. So it's just the other side of the airport from here, basically about the same distance from the airport. And it's around 50, just over 50 years old. We had our anniversary 50 years, a couple of years back. Uh, and then the Large Hadron Collider, which is the accelerator under the border here between us and the Jura Mountains. Uh, and just from the engineering point of view, I mean, it's just a, it's a 27 kilometer circumference. And it's about 50 to 150 meters uh, below the ground. And significantly, there are two, four detectors, uh, which are the four famous experiments, the Atlas CMS, LHCB, and Atlas. Uh, the closest of those to us is uh, the Atlas, in particular Atlas Point 1, I'll mention again later, because it has some relevance to Puppet uh, at the Atlas Point 1 station. And then generally the computing project for the LHC, so we have another project called uh, the LHC Computing Grid, and uh, the, pr the computing problem for LHC is largely one of data. Essentially, we have very large, massive digital cameras that produce around 15 petabytes of new data a year. Uh, and then to process that, we have uh, on the LHC grid, we have about 250,000 cores available, uh, CPU cores. And these are very much spread across uh, much of the globe, especially in Europe and North America, but right out to Japan, Australia, South America. Uh, and these are very much managed by the individual institutions and by the individual countries, and then we collaborate to create a computing resource to solve these fundamental questions. Uh, so last week, this was being, last month or so, this was being stressed to, its, to the highest level in order to get the result for last week's Higgs signal. Okay, so that was about um, CERN, introduction to CERN, basically. <laughs> So if we look at um, the current situation with the tool, tool, tools for IT at CERN, we have the very classic problems that many places have, which is uh, IT staff numbers remain fixed, but we need more computing capacity. So we, we, we are going to have more computing capacity. This is already sort of agreed and is going to happen, but we now need to adapt our tools to uh, work with that. And there are inefficiencies, and many of the tools we're using are becoming sort of brittle and a bit broken. So there's some core components which... We can't scale up, they've reached their limit basically. And also because they're in-house tools, things like porting them to IPv6 is just a very expensive and uh, slow, painful uh, project. The other significant thing that's happening at CERN is we now will be getting um, a second data center. So as of the last few months, it's agreed that we will have a second data center, which will be part of CERN territory uh, and be in Budapest in Hungary. So this means we now have a new remote computer center we have to manage. We're not allowed to just walk in and restart computers and things. So we have to be a lot more hands-off. And this, this uh, facility will come online, yeah, 2012 to 2014. Uh, looking back sort of 10 years ago, we, we developed um, this extremely large fa fabric management system, which was uh, the LFMS tooling system, and there was a significant part of that was was Quattro, and Quattro is a, is a live and healthy project today. It's available on SourceForge, you can download it and use it. And, uh, but um, 
What we realize today is that CERN no longer is the leading edge that it once was. Um, ten years ago, we were pretty large, but we now sort of hear figures of 80,000 machines at Rackspace and uh, 500,000 in Google, and uh, we realize that CERN is not at the forefront anymore in terms of size of computers. And really, so we should uh, look to see what's available as open source tools, stop using our own software, basically. So before we move on, actually, so what we decided to do was um, set up a, a new project at CERN called uh, the Agile Infrastructure Project. We want to be more flexible, be able to take on new software uh, for provisioning and deployment and configuration, and then pick and choose various bits of the software in a tool chain approach. So there are, really, there are two major parts to that. One is infrastructure and one is configuration, really. So I'll just do a, a little bit on infrastructure, but it's configuration is, is possibly more interesting. So these are very obvious goals that any computer center would want to do, really. So you know, improve the repair processes with virtualization. So we, at the moment, we don't have a good system whereby our operators are able to just unplug machines. They have to ask users, do you mind if I switch off a computer, which is fairly inefficient. Better tracking of usage. There are lots of underutilization in corners of the computer center. Uh, new use cases, e.g. cloud. Can we make the resource in Hungary just a single cloud resource to use? Uh, and then the scale, we're talking about 2015. So the 15,000 servers is a fairly, uh, that's the number of servers we're talking about. Of that, about 90% of that hardware will be basically providing virtualized machines. Uh, and then there's figure of 300,000 VMs needed. So this is an upper limit. It's been uh, banded around quite a lot. I think, A, this figure would only ever be reached in 2015. And uh, in reality, that's the absolute limit it will be, I think. It won't be that high. It'll be more than 100,000, but less than 300,000. And so if you look at then the um, plan for that provisioning, it's basically use OpenStack is the one line for how do we do this. Uh, as for um, configuration, then Puppet was one of two. There are basically two tools out there which are, I think, the clear leaders, which are Puppet and Chef. Puppet, for us, is a lot more like Quatter in the sense it's a, a declarative approach, uh, which we're used to. Uh, we're mainly a lot of sysadmins rather than developers, so again, possibly uh, Puppet's a better choice. And generally, all the things we'd like, like commercial support, is available. There is you know, a decent community, definitely. You can buy books in it. You can employ somebody who knows it better than you do, which is something we've never been able to do before. So Puppet was the uh, clear winner, basically. What we ended up with was... Um, this, is, this is actually the, the architecture we have now, and I won't go through it all, but it's, it's very standard in the sense that there's essentially some Git repositories feeding into a Puppet server, there's, um, we're using Foreman at the moment uh, to do some of the, the kickstarting of machines onto the Puppet server. We have some very much CERN existing services, and this is where a lot of the work has been actually, well, not, not, not a lot of the work, but a lot of the problems is because we have a CERN CA. We were determined to use the CERN certificate authority and not the one built into Puppet because we need it anyway for many other things. So we've had to create proxies between Puppet and the CA server, for instance. Uh, similarly, we, have, we don't really have a, a DNS as such. At CERN. We have DNS, but this is just a slave to a, another database called the network database, the LANDB. And so integrating Puppet with this database and things is uh, some of the work we've had to do. But other than that, it's a fairly standard uh, Puppet infrastructure, I'd say. I mean, going back to the very beginning, so this was back in January, we decided to uh, start using Puppet. And really, there was very few people on the corridor uh, in the IT department who had used Puppet, basically no one, essentially. So uh, we did literally start by downloading it, installing it, and having a go and see what happens. And uh, anyone can do it in a day. So somebody started last week, and the first task I gave them was to install Puppet on three nodes, and, and they did do it within one day. So the statement was true. Um, Configuring something with Puppet. Puppet doesn't actually add, in our experience, if you want to configure a service, it doesn't actually add much extra work to do it with Puppet than with by hand. But uh, definitely what's hard is deciding um, how all your modules fit together, basically. Do I have three modules that edit my grub.conf file? 
because I need to for NTP and I need to because it's on this operating system? Or do I have one grub file? And exactly how do you actually set up all your modules in a sensible and reusable manner? And I think at the start of the year, we had no plan for this at all, I think it's fair to say. So we just uh, went for the uh, easy solution, obvious solution. Some of the expectations at the start would be that we could just, that lots of things would just be done. We just download them and it would work. So we'd have no work to do. So things like SSH and IP tables, syscuttle, MySQL, all done, nothing to do. Or we go for one of these fuller solutions like example 42. And this kind of gave us a fr it gives you a framework to, to do everything. So the reality wasn't, it varied. Sometimes it was good. So things like IP tables was pretty good. But um, often modules randomly found the internet are too simple in the sense all they do is copy in a file and you go, well, that's okay, but it's not even a starting point really. Or there's too much abstraction. I mean, these big solutions like example 42 was, but you're no longer configuring public puppet. You're sort of basically configuring an entire layer of, of uh, variables to some extent. And one of the things was we wanted to stick to vanilla puppet so that when new starters came with basically dealing with Puppet rather than a highly specialized Puppet. Uh, and then the other thing was uh, parameterized classes. And we chose Foreman. I, I can't remember why we chose Foreman at the start, actually. It's one of those mysteries, and no one can remember why we chose Foreman and not the Puppet dashboard. Um, but parameterized classes and Foreman don't really work, essentially. You end up having to edit your modules so that uh, you can use the, the global parameters in the ENC. <coughs> So sharing and fixing modules and third-party modules. So our modules are littered currently with CERNism. So we have hard-coded NTP servers and subnets and strange, weird CERN authorization systems. And, uh, you know, and then they've been adapted to work with uh, Foreman and things. But the main problem, I think, was we were all learning Puppet as we went along, basically. So there's sort of 10 people committing to um, a common puppet area and none of us knew what we were doing to some extent. So we're learning from that and uh, we very quickly realized, so Hira is someone we, um, Hira, Hira. so it's something which we, looks very good for us. So we instantly realized that the reason why our modules were becoming so littered with Cernisms was because of the mix up of um, uh, basically some of the logic, configuration logic and some of the configuration data. So Hira really does actually bridge this gap. And we, we had this quite well with Quatter actually. There was a thing in Quatter called CDB, which contained nothing but variables. And there were these NCM components, which were basically Perl scripts to do the logic. And uh, we inst I instantly missed not having the separation, actually. And Hira really does uh, provide that. Uh, with Hira, there's, there's, pretty, there's not a lot of experience yet of how to use it. There's dozens of ways to use it, because you can set up these hierarchies based on facts, the way in which you organize your structure of where to look for the particular value of data is um, infinite, basically. Uh, and you see people on the, the public mailing list where people are sort of using higher in ways that probably wasn't intended to be used, and we certainly are in one case. Uh, so but basically looking forward to it becoming the standard that everybody uses, that's just there and works, essentially. I think it will improve things. We have a good plan to uh, share the modules we write as much as possible with other people. That, and that's not just with the general public. There are, there are many uh, puppet instances even within CERN, in fact. So if you look, so we're from the IT department, which run the large, so I'm from the IT department that runs the large uh, computer infrastructure. Uh, but there's also, there's a puppet farm that's been around for about a year or so. Uh, that was point one of about 250 nodes. This was in the firing line for the uh, actual experiment data for the last year. Uh, there's also been some people running um, on Amazon and on, on Rackspace. People have been configuring puppet boxes to do Atlas analysis. And then even today, a couple of people have come up to me today with people at Puppet, sorry, people at CERN who are using Puppet for things I didn't know existed actually. So. Even today, there's a couple of new things like the Open Lab project. 
Uh, other HEP labs, Hanninger Physics labs, are also switched into puppets. So some of the large sites like uh, DAISY in Germany. And then a, there's a conference called CHEP, which is uh, Computing and High Energy Physics. Uh, it's a large international conference. And there was a sysadmin fabric management session within there. And uh, it was clear that Puppet was the winner of this, essentially. So you had presentations from ourselves, CERN, but also uh, Berkeley Lab. PIC is a large institution in Barcelona. And from the Atlas experiment, all basically saying that we're using Puppet. There are a few chef people, but Puppet was, appeared to be the larger. And then there's a URL where we're sharing the early days of what modules we consider to be useful to others. Um, as I say, we started off fairly, um, sort of obviously, we're just all our modules in one directory. And we uh, soon realized that for new users, this was uh, fairly confusing where we had sort of the batch service as at the same level as a syscuttle configuration module. And uh, this was fairly confusing. So we switched to having sort of two directories of modules and manifests. And modules were these reusable syscuttle, reusable Apache, and manifests des describe basically the end level services. So a batch machine, a interactive logging machine, these kind of full on services. And then I think future plans split up modules. So there's some talk, I think, of Puppet 3 about having a vendor directory and things to try and uh, isolate what we've taken from upstream and are planning to maintain, maintain and push and pull to upstream versus stuff that really is internal because it describes our batch system. So maybe we can split up the modules more to make it more obvious. Uh, complexity of configuration. So these graph is... Um, number of machines per configuration type. So we have things like the large clusters of things like the batch system with uh, sort of plus 10,000 machines in them. Uh, sorry, plus 1,000 machines in them uh, down to tiny clusters of two or three nodes. Um, and actually the complexity is not a big deal for Puppet. I don't think there's any, there's no problem with having this many different types of machine, basically. There's not. Wide. I think where, we, where CERN still does have some speciality is the number of administrators. So we looked at the number of people who had some uh, commit rights to the configuration of CDB, the current configuration database system. And it's around 300 people, um, which was a lot more than we had expected, actually. Um, and particularly, these admins change a lot. They're in different continents. They have different bosses. There's no particular structure to these 300 people. There's people working, doing development, people running the production services, and we need to keep these people fairly separate to some extent. So this comes to sort of trust amongst sysadmins. We have lots of sysadmins, and our sort of current working aim is that we have, it's been whited out for some reason, so there's the Git modules, the puppet modules at the top in Git, and then we can at least share these uh, amongst the whole site, or possibly the whole site, and then we can share out those modules to different puppet masters or masters, or, uh, and then have the different teams managing their nodes. It's our sort of vague model that we're going to aim for. At the moment, we've still got a single path down here, so we're not too worried, and there's a lot of trust between the, the current puppet admins we have. I think this, this is the area which we're most unclear about what to do, actually. There's something which we would like to hear from other people about how they've dealt with untrusted admins. Not so much untrusted, but you want to protect yourself from mistakes from other people. So it comes down to, I think, change control in the dev cycle. And what we kind of have as a vague model is we have a core team of people like me maintaining OS and basics, hardware monitoring, NTP configuration, all these things. But then we have specialized teams running the batch service, running the uh, data acquisition service. And these guys are ultimately responsible for the stability of their service. Uh, and so they kind of want to stay slightly isolated in their own little universe. But also we don't want to be in a situation where every one of these teams has configured NTP in their own way. So that's sort of where we want to aim for, given the requirements. So some fault services will follow core updates. Some servers will choose uh, when they should take those updates. We also want to benefit for LXC. The LXC is the machine is switched off every now and again, and we get a chance to actually do some major work and try and resync everybody to a common base, if you like. 
Uh, and the, so when we sort of started using Puppet, we first very quickly came across these environments to get branches model. And this is great, basically, because it essentially allows you to do a lot of this, this kind of work where you have different people moving at different speeds and working in isolation, but still able to collaborate between the different environments. Uh, so we have some the obvious branches like production and devil branches, which uh, so the majority of machines are in production with a few nodes in development. And we have new configurations, so we have a whole new configuration with how we deploy the CA, for instance, uh, in a completely separate branch in isolation, but still running on the same infrastructure, which is nice. We don't have to duplicate the whole of the puppet infrastructure to run something in isolation. Um, there's a risk of divergence, of course, with allowing people to run their own branches. Uh, and the other thing we need to improve upon is our current release process. Pro current release process is a, a weekly push from devil down to uh, production blind, which is fine for now, for the, till the end of this year, it's absolutely fine. But by the end of the year, we have to have something in place that's uh, slightly more. So we, we use elsewhere in the project Alassian tools, and there was an Alassian presentation today, of course, about using Puppet for doing some of this code review. So we started so far basically adding things to Alassian, and then we need to get some process on top of there. The tr I think the difficult thing for us is still allowing having put some, if we put some really formal process in there to get a configuration change out there, then how do we allow someone to fix their typing mistake or their quick fix because they need to change the configuration because the service is broken or something. Uh, hardware provision, so we've heard a bit about hardware provision. Um, so we have, up to now we have a homegrown tool, like as was mentioned earlier today, because everybody has a homegrown tool for Provisioning, basically. Um, and it has some similarities to Razor, actually. So it does the same thing where we install a minimal operation system. It collects information. This is published into a couch database, uh, which has a lot of similarities, in fact, to what Razor is doing. Uh, so we need to look at Razor, actually. This is something we have to do. Because it, if we're moving to Puppet, then we will benefit if we look at this. Um, and the final thing, our current provisioning tool is add the host into Foreman, and then from there onwards it's Foreman and Puppet taking over, essentially. And Foreman's been good, basically, we've, particularly the kickstart templating has been very useful, so we have these host groups and different hardware models and we can template the kickstart file based upon that. Uh, Organising the host into host groups has been very natural, and the fact that it supports nested host groups uh, is very useful. So some of these are like five deep, where there's speciali specialisations of the batch system, which are five levels deep of host group. Um, and I think we will, but possibly in the next few months, um, we'll spend a bit more time integrating Foreman to some of these local CERN services. So I say we don't really have DNS as such when it's managed by a higher level database. Uh, and so we really need to start integrating that. We also similarly have a, uh, a central TFTP service which you authenticate against and this kind of work he's doing. And the CERN CA, we've definitely done some, we know that we want to use the CERN CA for sure with Puppet, so we've done some work already there. Uh, as for VM provisioning, so our workhorse um, virtual machine layer at the moment is uh, all based upon uh, Microsoft Hyper-V. And we have sort of 3,000 virtual machine virtual machines running in Hyper-V, of which about 70 are puppet managed. These are basically the development machines for the Agile project. Uh, as for getting into puppet, we pre-seed these into form and host group. This is not, I think, th this is not definitely not the eventual solution, and, and the eventual solution will be on OpenStack. Uh, the target we're currently trying to do is 200 hypervisors with about 4,000 puppet guests on them. Um, in the last week, that made some good progress, but I think the hypervisor installed the puppet VM to coming up now in the next week or so. Uh, machine images are created with ours. Machines are not preceded into Foreman, so one of the things we want the VMs to come up and basically register themselves. So we're using um, a couple of contextualization methods, this army config, and more recently we've been migrating to cloud in it. Uh, and these both, we can pass the variables in, like where the Puppet server is, obviously, and uh, where the Foreman host group is. 
So I think what the next steps to the end of the year is basically we have, we have to the end of this year to, to really be able to break the system and not provide really any reduction service to our customers, as it were. So one, some of the things we need to look at is look at PuppetDB. This has, um, we're not going to be in 300,000 days before the end of the year, but if it was, it's, it talks about a megabyte per machine of RAM. So it's a rather large amount of RAM at the moment, but, but it also says this depends a lot on how often you're configuring things. Um, Puppet dashboard we skipped for some reason. I think we installed it once and then for some reason we went to Foreman, but as I say, I don't remember why we did it. Uh, mCollective we have deployed, but we're not really using it for anything at the moment. It's there, you can run a query against it to find hosts. As the number of hosts increase, it's needed because we need to check for um, people need to do one-off queries of the service to find out the current state and look for configuration drift and this kind of thing. This is where M Collective is a, a very useful tool. Um, Foreman is adding uh, integration with OpenStack via the uh, FOG system, FOG uh, API. So this is another area which is interesting. Uh, generally, we have a lot of services which are running in Quator, and something we want to do more and more this year is migrate more services to Puppet, to Quator, from Quator to Puppet, obviously. Uh, Decide a scheme for secure blob delivery. So um, we need to get various secrets from a repository of some description to nodes, ranging from certificates, database passwords. And there are essentially there seem to be two methods for this, the Hero GPG one or uh, some sort of ACL file server. And they both have advantages and disadvantages. The first one's good because you get your values into your manifest, but it also means Anybody else using that Puppet Master can access all the other data there. Um, the file server method is good because only the hosts you say can retrieve the data, can get the, the secure blob, but it's harder to use because it's, the, it's not available in the manifest, the result. So, uh, yes, we need to do something there. So, I put um, some conclusion, I mean, it's the largest change to uh, the IT's deployment for five years. I think it's for 10 years, really. Uh, it's been fairly painless, actually. There's been no, although we've had to fix things and create some services, there's been no blockers of any description, really. I mean, we've more or less followed the, uh, the Puppet Pro book from chapter to chapter and basically deployed a working system. We did do things wrong the first time around. You know, lack of in-house experience, for sure. <coughs> As for scaling, we haven't done any tests yet to check the scaling. I think one of the things, the advantage of using Puppet is because lots of experiences out there, you can say that there are many people running you know, tens of thousands of machines, so probably getting that to 100,000 is not going to be too wide. And basically, it's, at the end of the day, Puppet, you can make work by adding more hardware to it. It scales well. So, and we do some sort of rough calculations of how many Puppet masters you need for... 300,000, it's probably up to 100 or so um, calls dedicated to running Puppet. But this assumes that it's a 15-second Puppet run and you're configuring every machine once an hour or something, which in reality we won't need to do. So it's probably lower than that. Uh, and lastly, I mean, it's a joy to work in the active community. I mean, coming from essentially a CERN project to a, uh, a much wider project is really quite a, a good thing for sure. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions at all? Hi.
scale at, at your level has worked for you guys on, on building stuff that, that kind of invalidates some cash or allows us to say, look, this is when Puppet needs to run on these machines because things have changed, either the manifest or facts. There's some ways to do that where we're not just burning up cycles yeah. running Puppet and creating exactly the same catalog and then trying to apply it. We can at least, very least, like when buy it to create catalogs, we don't have to burn the cycles on the appliance because most of the catalogs are the same. There's, there are things you can do Uh, we run it every, uh, today because because we can because there's no problem at 500 hosts doing it every hour and it's convenient. Um, it's obvious that some of our configurations, like the batch machines, really never change. So the only time they ever change is a new admin turns up in the group or something like that, and we have to change some access rights, or occasionally we have to install some new software. Um, but most of the changes we're doing, yeah, we we do actually. They're mostly human operations where someone's coming up and changing the system. I need to install some new software. So doing it by a trigger base rather than by maybe something's changed. I mean, already we started using the, um, the schedule mechanism to say, because things like the monitoring information on a batch work doesn't change at all, basically, ever. <laughs> so this kind of thing, but it, it doesn't actually... The, I think it's the compilation time is actually the significant things, yeah. not the... Uh, not the scheduling of the actual checking. The so, and also that's also much, much more how Quata used to work in the sense that it was done, if, if a piece of code changed, then run it, essentially for a piece of configuration, which had more that model. But still, I think, when we actually do want to do a change, we do want the change to happen relatively quickly, basically. We don't, we don't want to say, only run once per week, because then we've got so much drift across the system that this is also not good. But it depends what it is, actually. It depends. Well, one of the things that you've emphasized is information. <coughs> so you can say, so you can schedule based on information that, yeah. that Puppet has, and Puppet and Imposter have about your deployment. You can say, on all my machines that are on this side, or have this back, or this yeah. package, or anything that you can match with an Imposter query, run Puppet. And yeah. you can build some standard interfaces for doing that for people that are working. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and also I think if we if we can ed dedicate a lot of machines to doing the Puppet Master, if we also use those same CPUs for something else as well, so that means we can actually we could run it across batch at the same time, because we wouldn't have the Puppet machines idle otherwise. Please do, yeah. There is, there is no magic quota to puppet script. It doesn't exist, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, essentially, I think the next time you're scheduling in a, a, an operating system update or something major, you then adapt your service to puppet, basically. I think there isn't a magic. Clearly, you do it and you speak to people who've done the same thing yourselves before, but um, same things as you want to do. No, the, the quota will um, exist as, as long as it needs to, but I think it, it, we'd like to terminate it at the time, same time scale that we terminate SL6, for instance. So a number of years. But if you take it to the new computer center, there's a new computer center, a big aim is not to have quota running in Hungary at all. It would only be running puppet there, for instance.
using Puppet. Uh, I don't think it's it's nothing. It's it's you know it's megabytes per it's 20 megabytes per um, Puppet run. Basically, a bit of JSON file. There's nothing. It's not something we're ever going to notice. Basically, no. I mean, it's just irrelevant. Even even if we have the Puppet masters here and the machines in Hungary, it's just we won't notice. I mean, it's irrelevant. I think it's, uh, it's probably less than uh, a quarter description is probably longer than a puppet description of the same node, for instance. So it's actually going down, if anything. How much time um, to get rid of the old solution? Um, <laughs> as I say, I mean, my, my benchmark has always been if we end up installing Quata machines on SL7, which then means what we're talking another three or four years from now, I will be disappointed, basically. But I, but I see there's, there's no need to actually kick people off the current infrastructure just because we want them to. It's... Uh, Okay. I don't know. <laughs>